I, I actually thought she was going to eat her phone. If I dropped an apple in chocolate, I would eat it. But just kidding. <laughs> oh, tough crowd. <laughs> if you had an apple, you'd be throwing it right now. <laughs> Um, yeah, today we're uh, wrapping up this series on hashtag struggles. Uh, I've learned a lot about social media through this process and, and uh, reading Craig Groeschel's book on, um, that he wrote on hashtag struggles and, you know, everything from not, not how it can cause us to be uh, discontented in life, uh, not as compassionate as we should be. Uh, different ways, but well, you know, uh, I, I said at the start of the series, the only selfie I'd ever taken was uh, at a Nebraska football game. I wanted to get the scoreboard in the back, but I've been practicing uh, my selfies, uh, and I'm getting better at them. Uh, I have to say, though, uh, I did notice something generationally. Uh, I was at this conference last week, and, and I want to thank uh, Pastor John and Pastor Steve and and Pastor Chera, and I, I guess there was a backup speaker. Uh, I didn't know it took three pastors to replace me, but uh, it, was, it was a blessing to me to hear uh, just how broken hearts were mended last week, and I thank you for, uh, for being here to share that. Also, uh, uh, the thing I noticed generationally was whenever I was going to do a selfie, and I was around people my age, they constantly were jumping in saying, can I take it for you? <laughs> no, I'm practicing my selfies, okay? And it, but when I was around, and, and it struck me that none of the other younger people would ask that. Because they know not to interrupt a good planned selfie. And, uh, and so I, I, I took some. I wanted to share with you a greeting from some folks. Uh, this, this is, a, a, you, you may recognize these folks, but the Schmitz and the Lagerlofs got to spend a couple days with them and, uh, and go to church with them, and it was great. Um, there's something about me when I take selfies you're going to recognize, I think. Uh, but if you look at the next one, uh, one of the blessings... Uh, is you can kind of send those things that strike you funny. This is Lulu's bed and breakfast. You make both. And then I had a self me of my bed not made, so I didn't show that one. But the next one is uh, when I ran into old friends, a real blessing was uh, Lisa and I knew these folks. A lot of them I was running into, and I take a selfie and, and send it to her, and, and she could share that, that with me even though she wasn't there. And so there were old friends and some new friends. This friend actually saying, Jesus loves me. The meanest bird in the whole coop, but he's saying, Jesus loves me. And uh, so God does love the worst of us. But anyway, I just thought I'd share. Uh, I have grown in my, but did you notice something about me when I take selfies? My mouth is always open. Guess because I'm concentrating, but uh, today as we get into uh, this topic, it's it's such a important one today, and that's the whole idea of of rest. It was important for God uh, to command His people to rest, and technology uh, has this love hate relationship, or we have a love hate relationship with it. I love learning some of this new stuff. I love what it can do to connect people. Uh, what it can do actually to get the Word of God out uh, in ways that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. And, and yet, there's a reality that it can also uh, do damage. It can separate people. Uh, it, rather than being face-to-face -face and one-on-one -on -one with people, it causes us to depend too much on uh, and, and not being present, doing uh, things the easy way. So as we get into this today, I want to look at a passage with you. But first of all, <coughs> one author stated 
that uh, social media is, is a lot like money. It's a great servant, but it's a terrible master. Did you hear that? Uh, social media is, is a lot like money. It, it makes a great servant, but it's a terrible master. And this passage from 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 12 says, Everything in, is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be what? Mastered by anything. The reality is, because of our fallen nature, we all become mastered by different things in our lives. Uh, one uh, sociologist actually said that uh, social media is a lot like food in regard to it mastering us, different than, say, uh, drugs or alcohol or uh, other things we become addicted to because the reality is we, we need food, right? And we need social media to a certain extent to exist in our world today, but we don't need those other things. So uh, when, when we look at this being mastered, now some of you may have gone through this series and say, I don't know what the big deal is with this social media. I'm not, I'm not addicted to it. And, and that could be true. So all you need to do today is just look down the road to the person you know that is addicted to it and, you know, kind of wag your head once in a while when I say something that's appropriate to them. No, I, what I'm wanting you to do and all of us to do is, is look at what are, what are the things that have mastered me. It doesn't have to be social media. It might be something else. It, c it could be sports. Uh, it, it could be money. You know, there's a lot of things that can take control or master us and, and cause us <coughs> to leave Jesus out of the equation. The reality is, uh, everything's permissible. By the way, the context of this is, is eating um, um, food sacrificed to idols. And Paul's saying, hey, you know what? If it's going to cause a brother to stumble, don't do it. You have the right to do it, but you don't have to, so don't. And it's the same for anything in our lives, including uh, social media. So uh, the, the reality is, is that <clears throat> Christ in me is bigger than anything that could master me. But the reality is, sometimes we succumb to those other things. And so today, I want to uh, just share from uh, Pastor Craig's book uh, the six things that you might uh, be aware of in regard to if you're addicted to social media or not. The first one is... Uh, no, we don't have them. Then in that case, you'll have to buy the book and read it. <laughs> no, we'll go on to nomophobia, okay? Uh, nomophobia is actually a condition that doctors have. It's a new uh, diagnosis. It actually means uh, no access uh, to electronic phone and, uh, and the fear of that. And uh, just some of the statistics that came out of that, not, not this one here, but uh, another one was that 66% of the general population exhibit some signs of nomophobia. And you're like, how many of you think you're addicted in any way to your phone? I'm just curious. I found out I am. Uh, Dolores can vouch for that. I, I misplaced my phone for a couple days not too long ago, and, and I was a little frantic, you know. There were people I knew were trying to get a hold of me, and it was like, uh, you know, I felt at, at odds that I couldn't, that I couldn't find it. Uh, so the, we're the general public, but uh, it goes on to say that actually 77% of 
of 18 to 24 year olds won't hand their phone over to you. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that's interesting. Now, this one that we had up, if you'll put that back up again, it's, it's kind of list, it's listed here in your outline. 58% uh, of people don't go one waking hour without checking their phone. 59% uh, check email at the t uh, when it comes in. 89% check it daily on vacation. 80% of teenagers sleep with their phones. And 84% of people believe uh, they couldn't go one day without their phones. One day. Uh, now, uh, my question, where does this come from? I don't know, but even if they're talking up in the 80 percentiles of their study, uh, if you had a, a margin of error, you're still well over half. And, and so it's, it's something that's big in our society today. Nomophobia. Uh, if Christ is living in me and he's bigger than anything that can master me, uh, what can we do about this? Nomophobia can apply to me in de varying degrees. Like if I, the last thing I do at night is check my phone, the first thing I do in the morning is check it. Anybody there? Yeah, I'm there. How about uh, anybody ever text while they're driving? Don't, don't hold your hand. That's, you know, there's commercials about that. Very, very graphic commercials about that. Uh, I saw a creative one. While I was down in Arizona, by the way, it's cold down there. Did you know that? It was only three degrees warmer down there one morning as it was here. That was just a side light, but <coughs> where was I? It's the medication, okay? <coughs> uh, I really lost my train of thought. <coughs> See, I was born in Ed, uh, winter. Oh, yeah, the commercial. Very, very good commercial. Uh, it, it had these two girls going in a payphone booth, right? And they put a quarter in, and they called home. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a throwback. And, and then the next thing you know, uh, it, it's modern day, and a girl gets in the car and starts driving and starts texting home and is in a terrible accident. And they said at the bottom, they said, a phone call used to cost 25 cents. Now it costs a life. And so we, we need to be aware of what social media can do for us in regard to our lives on a regular basis. So in the, in the context of every generation and whatever tries to master us, uh, God has a special rest for each and every one of us. And I want you to see this in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And this is in the New Living Translation. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors. Just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best. Hear this last part. Let us do our best to enter that rest. It, it's interesting to me that we have to work at rest. <laughs> we have to be intentional about rest. Because the world we live in, in our nature, is one of not resting. Uh, and, and the more modern we get, and the more uh, we can have lights on at night, the more... We can stay up, the more we can busy our minds, the harder it is to find that rest. It's a special rest, and I want you to know that God's rest here is a holy rest. You can think of all kinds of ways you might have rested physically and been refreshed physically, but even the physical rest without the rest for the soul is really no rest at all. And that's what God wants for us more than anything, is rest for our souls. And so as we get into this, we see 
Uh, a quote here, uh, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our soul is restless until it finds rest in you. St. Augustine, uh, that's, that's the order that Luther came from, and Luther uh, really utilized this in his life on a regular basis. There's a Christ-shaped void in all of our lives that makes us frantic and causes us to busy ourselves because we're afraid. Nomophobia, afraid we're going to miss out, afraid we're going to miss something. And that Christ-shaped void can only be filled by Him. In Matthew 11, 28 and 29, it says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, I want you to notice something here, because we kind of jump to the second part, and we forget about the first part. We often look at, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We often look at that second part as we're yoked with Christ, and it's talking about our work with him. And it's not. It's really talking about resting in him. He says, come to me if you're weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. It's a gift. And it's based on the work he's already done completely. And so the yoke we take on him is a yoke that has been completed in Jesus Christ. And that gives us the rest we need. And so today, what I want to do as we get into this is I want to look at how do we find rest. And it's, it's really pretty simple on your outline there. The first thing we see is, uh, in Psalm uh, 46, 10a, is be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We often look at that and we go, okay, I just got to be still. But we forget the second part. What's the second part? And know that I am God. What, in, in other words, be still and focus your attention on who? On God. That's like remembering the Sabbath day without keeping it holy if we don't think about God, if we don't remember God, if we don't rest our souls in the peace that we have with Him. And so today we got to remember, have you ever been with a child that just can't sit still? Have you ever been married to a grown child that can't sit still? can drive you crazy. It can make you uh, weary just trying to keep them from hurting themselves. And, and you want to get to a place where you just, just sit still. And you almost hear God pleading with us. Why are you so frantic? What are you so worried about? Why do you have so much fear? Just be still and know I got it all under control. I got you covered. Your eternity's done. And by the way, until you get there, I got the rest of it too. I even got the difficult things that you're dealing with. The things you're fretting about. Be still and know that I am with you. I said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You are mine. In Psalm 131, it says, uh, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child in my soul within me. King David, by the way, this whole psalm uh, is when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in. And he, he's humbling himself. He's saying, you know, but I, I, you notice who quieted his soul? He did. By what? Focusing on God and the presence of God in his midst. Now, I don't know much about <coughs> weaning children. You can ask my wife about that, but uh, I've been around cattle a lot. When you take those calves off the, off the heifers, what do they do? Ball incessantly. And when you got a hundred of them out there bawling, and then all of a sudden, 
they start eating the creep feed and other things, and, and it just stops. And it's just calm. That's what he's talking about. And, and that's something we learn. When we're in our infant stages of faith, it's hard. We do cry out. He may hear us. He might not react to it. But he's never far from us. He's with us. And so today we be still before him. In Pastor Gorshel's book, he talked about going to a therapist because he was always so anxious. When I was at this conference, a lot of the speakers, very successful pastors in big churches, talked about how assailed they were a lot of times by anxiety and strife and burning out their staff and, and different things and how they needed help at different times. Pastor Gorshel is no different, the one who wrote this book. <coughs> and he said he went to his therapist and he said, <coughs> Craig, do you know what you need to do? Be still for five minutes. Craig's response was, I pay you $95 to give me that advice. And then he, then he goes on to explain how hard it was to be still for five minutes. A day. Five minutes. Without your mind going somewhere else, but being focused on the Lord. Without thinking about this or that. Would you be able to do it? To be still for five minutes a day uh, and, and just think of nothing but the Lord. I want to I want to just pause here. I want you to just be still. We'll be still together. I want to blow my nose first. Close your eyes so you don't have to watch this. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we close our eyes. Mm. Lord, today we we just quiet ourselves, quiet our hearts, our minds. We're just looking at you. What we see is a God of the whole universe. A God that made everything so big we can't see it all. We see a God that that made everything that is so small we can't see it either. And yet you can we are truly fearfully, wonderfully made. Lord, as small and as fragile as we are, your attention is so focused on us that it caused you to. Send the Son very special son, your own dear son, Jesus. Caused you to allow him to come into this frazzled and crazy world. You, you let your son take our sin, our discontentment, our lack of compassion, our our weariness on himself. He allowed him to take it to that cross. And then you turned your back on him. You forsook him like you would forsake us in our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God. And 
so we have peace. Our souls are at rest. Time to wake up. <laughs> How's that feel? Is that good? That's good. It's even better when it's focused on what we have in Jesus. And so the second part <coughs> is, is a little bit of homework. And I'm going to leave this to you. And that's to make a plan. And I want you to think in terms of, uh, as Pastor Gorschel said, we, we, should, we need to think both defensively and offensively. Good teams are good at both. And so when you think in terms of the uh, defensive side, it's, it's like, what, what am I going to do? What can I do with my phone? Uh, you know, to not have it. I decided I'm going to start putting my phone in my box outside my office when I'm meeting with people. I mean, I, that just came as an idea. I need to just get away from it so I can focus on the people that I'm with. I'm not going to take it. Y yesterday I was teaching new member class and my Siri started answering me. I'm going, why do I have that thing in here? So, you know, be, be defensive, but also be offensive. And that's where, <coughs> as Jeremiah says, we go back to the old plans. We go back to the ancient ways. The encouragement to go off like Jesus did by himself to pray. To find that place of quietness. To enjoy being with the Lord and focusing on him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, consider all the ways that we can be distracted in this world and, and our rest can be robbed in so many ways, we, we come to you, our true rest. Because the rest is in the good news of Jesus Christ. Rest for our souls, for an eternity, but also for today. Uh, rest in the difficulties and the struggles that we're facing at this moment. A rest that can help us to overcome anything that would master us. Help us to put a plan together, both defensively and offensively, to, to be able to rest in you on a regular basis. It's your desire for us to be still and know that you are God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, with that... Uh, what I want to do today is, uh, before we pray, I want to invite a uh, special guest. It's really appropriate we talk about rest being in the Word uh, on Gideon Sunday. And uh, uh, Steve Raybach is here, uh, and I'm going to invite him forward uh, to visit with us a little bit about what the Gideon ministry is doing. Steve, please. We're on red there, Mr. Biss. Oh, I should have turned it on. There it is. There, how's that? Well, I had these notes that I uh, that I was going to read uh, to you, tell you about the Gideons, and and uh, I looked at the bulletin. Mark had uh, put in a, uh, a summary about the Gideon ministry, and it's such a good summary that I'm going to ignore my notes. I just ask you to take a look at that, and I'll tell you uh, a lot that you need to know about the Gideons. First of all, though, I would like to thank Pastor and thank the congregation very much for allowing us to come in and, and uh, talk to you this morning. Uh, really been moved today by your service. Uh, I was listening to your praise team sing, and 
One of the songs that they sang was uh, Christ, My Living Hope. I love that song. That is such a good song. And there's so much truth to that. I know some of you here know me, but uh, for those of you that don't, I'm a, my day job, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and, and I'm a Christian too, believe it or not. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, uh, lawyers and pastors get to see a lot of pain in this world. And we all experience pain because there is a lot of pain in this world, but uh, it's part of our job dealing with people's pain. And uh, lately, I've, especially, I've been dealing with uh, clients, people that have just really hurting bad. And it was just, uh, it was so appropriate today. I heard that song, uh, Christ, Our Living Hope, is, you know. And isn't that the truth, folks? Amen. <coughs> and listening to uh, what the pastor had to say, verses that he read talking about rest and all that, and it was just so appropriate to uh, what I've been feeling and uh, what I've been experiencing lately. You know, the Gideons, uh, our ministry is to uh, tell people about Jesus, not only our living hope, but their living hope. And we do that basically in two ways. One, by our personal testimonies, and number two, by uh, giving out Bibles uh, to uh, you know, motels and hospitals and doctor's offices and, and uh, lawyer's offices, uh, schools, prisons, you name it. We're in over 200 countries now, and uh, we translate the Bible on the, over... Uh, 90 different languages now. And of course that costs money. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today uh, is to ask you, first of all, for your prayers for the Gideon ministry. There are places that, uh, there are countries that don't let us in. And there are churches that won't let us in either. In fact, there are some churches right here right here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that used to let us in, that will not let us in anymore. That's why I say thank you so much for letting us come. One of the things that always impressed me about the Gideon ministry and one of the reasons I got involved in it was that every dollar that's contributed to the Gideons goes either for the purchase or for the shipping of Bibles. None of it goes for administrative costs. Gideons pay all of their own expenses. So you can rest assured, if you give the Gideons a dollar, that dollar is going to go for Bibles. Why is it so important for people to have Bibles? We just think about the verses that we heard this morning that touched me, and I think they touched you too. Where do you find those verses? You find them in the Bible. The Bible's about God's reaching out to mankind. It started after the fall in the Garden of Eden, where God came into the garden knowing full well what had happened, that Adam and Eve had sinned, and instead of turning away from them, he reached out to them. What did God say? Genesis 3, verse 9, where are you? We didn't, God didn't leave us. We left God. And the whole story of the Bible is God's outreach to us. It started there. I like to say that that's where grace actually started. Then you look at John 3, 16. That's a verse that you all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. That's why we 
That's why we give out Bibles to people. And then there's all the other <coughs> stuff, too, that's in there, like some of the things we heard about today. There's no better book. It's more than a book. It's the Word of God. And Lord knows people need the Word of God. So, uh, I'll be at the back at the end of the service. I want to ask you for two things. Number one, again, your prayers. And number two, if the Spirit moves you, if you would uh, want to contribute to the Gideons, uh, I just have to say uh, God bless you. Thank you again for letting me come and uh, spend some time with you today. Uh, stay right here. Right here. Let's, uh, let's lift this ministry up to our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for uh, Mark and our congregation who's dedicated to this ministry and, and for Steve and, and the many others that have a burning desire to, to continue to help you to say to those lost and hiding out there, where are you, uh, through your word. Uh, continue to bless their efforts as the word of God goes into more and more hands and eventually hearts. Uh, may we do all we can to be a support to that and to help them carry out the ministry of putting your word into people's lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Steve. Amen. God's peace.